Hello and welcome back. Uh, you'll notice I'm in yet a different location. I'm in my uh, office at uh, St. Jude's and yes, those are hockey sticks behind me. So uh, as you can tell, this is a highly mobile uh, endeavor, uh, even though I'm supposed to be uh, staying at home. Nonetheless, I, I stop in by the, um, at the missions uh, daily. So at any rate, we're going to continue today with the Gospel Matthew Bible Study, uh, Chapter 4. But of course, uh, let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Direct, O Lord, we beseech you all our actions by your gracious inspirations, and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always with you, and by you be happily ended, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. The Saint Matthew, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Okay, uh, so we have gone through some very dense uh, chapters thus far, and this one will certainly be dense as well. Uh, but after this chapter, we're going to get into the uh, Sermon on the Mount, so more direct teaching. So it's going to be a little bit more uh, straightforward um, after this chapter, at least for a little while. Uh, so nonetheless, uh, we're reminded uh, the first two chapters were about the infancy uh, of Jesus, um, his lineage from the line of King David, how Joseph is the rightful heir to the throne. Joseph is adopting Jesus as his son, as a man adopts God, the reversal of uh, God adopting man, uh, Solomon, namely about a thousand years before Christ. Um, and so at any rate, Christ comes into this world uh, with the idea of um, fulfilling the many promises and prophecies uh, the promise that David's kingdom would last forever, and the prophecy that even though we had lost the lineage of the kings during the Babylonian exile about 600 years before Jesus, nonetheless, God is, is a God of his word. And he said this kingdom would last forever, and therefore we're going to await a promised uh, king uh, to restore the kingdom. And so a king is anointed with oil, uh, typically, and so anointed one, of course, in Greek is Christ, Christos, um, and anointed one in Hebrew is uh, Messiah. So that's why the, these words are so central to our faith, um, because they're deeply rooted in the Old Testament. And again, for 600 years, waiting for the restoration of the kingdom by the coming of a king or an anointed one, a Christ, a Messiah. In chapter 3, uh, we were introduced to the figure of John the Baptist, who was promised by the prophet Malachi in particular uh, that uh, Elijah would come again to usher in uh, this messianic age. Um, and even though John the Baptist isn't Elijah himself, he comes in the spirit of Elijah. He's described as being dressed as Elijah. He um, is very much uh, fulfilling this this prophecy. And so, you know, the Jews, knowing the prophecies of, of Daniel, who said, look, you can anticipate the coming of the Messiah in roughly this time period, you know, many centuries from now. And the Jews at the time of Jesus knew we are in the time period that Daniel prophesied. Um, and so uh, at any rate, uh, we know that his coming is imminent with the advent of John the Baptist, uh, who's whose coming was prophesied as well. Uh, so he has come. Uh, our Lord, uh, of course, was baptized. And it's so important to keep in mind that at the Lord's baptism, he's being anointed not with oil, but he's being anointed uh, by the Holy Spirit. You know, remember that uh, back in 1 Samuel 16 or whatever it was, when, king, when uh, David was anointed king, uh, the prophet Samuel anointed him with oil, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon uh, David. So even though John isn't using oil here, nonetheless, he's baptizing Jesus. Not that Jesus had any sin or needed to be cleansed, um, but rather as an example for us. And through this baptism, uh, the, the Spirit in the form of a dove comes and descends upon Jesus. Jesus is anointed, and he's anointed king this whole gospel is about the kingship. And so at the beginning of our Lord's public ministry, it's made manifest that he's being anointed king. 
He's beginning his kingly reign by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, that's where we left off. Now we go straight into chapter four, which again, these chapters and verses, these things uh, were added later. Um, so there shouldn't be large divisions necessarily in our mind going from the end of one chapter to the beginning of another. So at any rate, it says the beginning of chapter four, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay. Immediately. There's no break. Okay. Um, couple of things right off the bat. When we hear about the temptation, um, maybe in our modern English ears, we kind of figure somebody who was on the verge of giving in. You know, I was tempted. I was, I was entertaining, you know, the, the thought of giving in to whatever. But, you know, at the last second, I chose not to. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. Really, a better word would be tested. Jesus is being tested. Um, and then, of course, you know, one, one image should be very obvious to us. That of the Exodus. That the people of God have gone through the Red Sea. And they were, the, they were redeemed, they were bought back by God as God's firstborn son among the nations, the, the Jewish people. Uh, so they go through water, and then they're in a desert for not 40 days, but 40 years for the duration of a life, of a, of a lifetime. And what happens during those, that time in the desert, um, they're being tested. You know, God has taken them back as his son, his firstborn son. Are they going to live up to that dignity? Are they going to be, um, they going to act like a firstborn son of God? Um, think about it. Adam went through the same thing. You know, the waters were parted, dry land emerged. Man is created out of the slime of the earth. God puts his spirit uh, into him, um, breathes into Adam. And as the Gospel of Luke says, Adam is a son of God. Um, will Adam live up to that, to that uh, dignity of being a son? And so Adam is tested. He's given the rule, you know, not to touch of the, the, the fruit of that particular tree. He's tested and he failed. The people of Israel, uh, they were tested. And of course, they failed. Uh, they failed so miserably, in fact, that they weren't allowed to go into the Holy Land. They had to wait. That's why they were in the desert 40 years. They had to wait those 40 years uh, for that generation, that wicked generation to die off. And then the next generation, which had grown up basically in the desert, they would be the ones going into the Holy Land. All right, so this should be in the back of our mind as we're reading this. So Jesus is led by the Spirit, just as the people of Israel were led by that the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. They were led uh, in the desert. Okay, so Jesus is led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, again, hearkening 40 years. Um, and afterwards, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay. All right. So this is our first uh, test, our first uh, temptation. If you are the son of God, um, like Adam, he was created in God's image and likeness in a way he's a son of God. If you really are that, then you're going to follow the commands. Um, people of Israel, if you really are the firstborn son of God amongst the nations, then you'll act accordingly. If you, Jesus, are the son of God, uh, this is, there's the twist, then, you know, show me your power. Uh, and it, of course, there are many, many ways we can read into these various temptations. Um, the brothers Karamazov of Dostoevsky, um, with his famous uh, chapter, The Inquisitor, um, this has an absolutely brilliant um, interpretation of these. So we can go many directions with the three temptations, but we're going to try to keep it simple. Um, and so he's appealing to the senses, to the sense appetites. If you're, if you're hungry, um, and obviously many, many, many in the world today, when their sense appetite is appealed to, whether it's food or strong drink or the sexual appetites, whatever, um, they, can, they just buckle. Um, 
but Christ, uh, he doesn't. Okay. And he responds by quoting Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, you know, during a discourse in which this idea of testing is being discussed. Okay, and he says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's interesting, Jesus is the word. He's the word of God, which proceeds from God. So he's kind of reflecting um, who he is in this, in this response. All right, the second temptation. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels charge over you and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. All right, so that is the second uh, temptation. So the pinnacle or parapet of, of the temple isn't the, uh, the temple itself, which, I mean, is a tall structure and all, but um, actually it's the north, excuse me, the southwest corner of the Temple Mount, uh, which, you know, is uh, the, um, the valleys go on both sides of the, of the Temple Mount area. Uh, that's where that's why Jerusalem is situated where it is because it's surrounded by valleys, which made it very fort um, an easily defensible position. And so, on the uh, eastern side of the Temple Mount is a very, very, very steep. And so, at any rate, if you go to the Holy Land, um, you go to the southeast corner of where the Temple Mount is, and you'll see exactly what where he's talking about. So it's a very it's a very steep fall, and so. He's talking about um, uh, the devil is going to use scripture here um, and quoting from Psalm 90 or 91, depending on uh, which version you have, um, which was reflecting about how um, God would take care of his chosen people in the wilderness those 40 years that their, their, their shoes wouldn't wear out, etc. Um, and so uh, he's talking about how God had promised to protect his people. And so he's, he's twisting that and turning that into a temptation to God. Um, and of course, our Lord quotes Deuteronomy again, um, but this time chapter six, first one was chapter eight of Deuteronomy. You shall not tempt uh, the Lord your God, okay? Um, of course, Jesus is the Lord God, and that's exactly what the devil's doing. He's tempting God, he's tempting Jesus. All right, and then verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. All right, so that's the third and final temptation. First of all, uh, the number three is important. Uh, where there are numerically three temptations, tests perhaps, but also uh, three is also the number of completeness. Uh, so Christ was completely tested. There's no way in which he wasn't tested. And so that's a consolation for us. So when we're tested, we can be reminded that God took on human nature himself. Um, and he too was tested, uh, but he did not fall. In fact, he charts a path uh, for us. So if we work on complete union with him, uh, then we too can chart through this, uh, this course. We don't have to die in the desert. We don't have to sin. We don't have to succumb to these tests or temptations. All right. And so, um, of course, uh, our Lord is re, uh, referring to himself as well. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Okay, and, that, and the devil is trying to twist that <laughs> and having him do the exact opposite, just as the opposite was ha had with the uh, temptation. So um, once again, our Lord is quoting Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. So it's sort of a, uh, a Bible off. Um, the devil and our Lord uh, quoting scripture back and forth at each other. But it's important to know that uh, our Lord doesn't refute uh, the devil's ability to give kingdoms to him. Uh, we're reminded that the devil is the prince of this world, period. I mean, Christ 
is king principally in heaven. His kingdom begins here in the church, uh, but this world still belongs to the prince of this world, which is not our Lord, but the devil. Um, so that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, you know, people today think that uh, the world's basically, you know, an, an okay place, that we can trust the world. Um, but throughout, especially the New Testament, the early Christian writers, um, they had sort of a militancy about them, sort of a bunker mentality that you can't trust the world. If the world hated me, our Lord said, it will hate you as well. Uh, and so the early church was not interested in being friends with the world or even dialoguing with the world. The early church was interested in converting the world, trying to get as, sneak as many people from the world into you know, their hidden bunker uh, where they could be safe, where the true king uh, was, was reigning. Um, so that's something to be kept in mind for us as well. Okay, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. All right, so our Lord has been completely tested in the desert, not for 40 years, but for 40 days. And he, unlike Adam, unlike the, the people of Israel, he is going to succeed. He's not going to fall. He didn't. He succeeded. He is the true son of God. All right, so now we go into the next um, section of chapter four, the beginning of Jesus's preaching. All right, so verse 12. Now when he heard that John, John the Baptist, had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, towards the sea, across the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. Okay, uh, and from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're probably going to guess there's a lot in there. <laughs> there certainly is. All right, so John the Baptist has been arrested. Um, by whom? Herod. Not Herod the Great, who died when Jesus was a baby uh, or a toddler, but um, uh, uh, Herod Antipas, so a, um, a uh, successor, really. I mentioned last time that the region of Galilee was run by um, the Romans directly, by procurators, after Herod the great son, Archelaus, uh, served um, for a while. Uh, then the Romans decided, you know what, we're just going to... Um, we're going to rule this place directly, so they started sending procurators, but that was just in the southern area of, of the Holy Land. And I might as well bring up this, this map, because we're going to need it a bunch. Um, so Judah and Judea is this region down here, okay? So that's where the southern kingdom uh, was. Basically, uh, well, we'll get into that in a second. And so at the region of Galilee is, is up north. It's up here, okay? That's the Sea of Galilee. Really, it's just a lake. Um, and if it were in America, it would have, you know, million-dollar homes on it. It's a very, very beautiful place. Uh, almost seems tropical, given all the, the birds and the vegetation, etc. Uh, so, at any rate, up... Uh, so, the, the Romans were ruling the Judea uh, down here. And... Uh, so Herod was allowed to rule up in the Galilee region. Of course, he had to report to Rome uh, and all that, but he ruled up in Galilee. So uh, Herod uh, had John arrested. Uh, we won't go into it a whole lot now, but it's because Herod was in an invalid marriage. Herod had married his brother's wife. His brother ran off with another woman to France, and so Herod said, hmm, and he took his brother's wife, which was um, invalid, and John the Baptist, who was a very popular preacher, very well known, called him out on it and said, you're in an invalid marriage. And so we remember um, the whole uh, thing where Herod threw a party and his daughter performed a dance and she wowed the, 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 the guests. And he said, all right, anything you want, I'll give you. And she asked her mom. Her mom said the head of John the Baptist. And why was that? 
because John the Baptist was preaching against her marriage. She was the one most at risk by the preaching of John the Baptist. That's why she demands John's head. And they, so, um, well, that's after John had been arrested. So that's how John ends up dying. Uh, but um, John is arrested uh, because of all this. So at any rate, he's suffering on behalf of marriage, uh, the true nature of marriage. Um, so that's up. Uh, so uh, John had been arrested. So Jesus withdrew to Galilee, so to that northern region. Uh, and leaving Nazareth, um, let's see if I can find a picture where Nazareth is. Greco Roman period. All right, here's another. All right. So if you can see this, all right, so that's the Sea of Galilee, really the lake, the Jordan River going down to the Dead Sea. Dead Sea Scrolls were found right there. Jerusalem is right here. Um, the region of Samaria is right here. We'll talk about that later. Um, Nazareth is here. It's kind of west, southwest of the Sea of Galilee. So not too far, uh, but not uh, super close either. So our Lord, uh, who grew up there, until the age of 30, um, was in Nazareth, which is sort of a Hickville, <laughs> in the mountainous region there. And so he begins his public ministry going up to this uh, northwestern corner of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, okay? And so this region, as we see, is, is a region of Zebulun and Naphtali, all right? So the two of the 12 tribes of Israel uh, settled in this region, the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, okay? So that's where Jesus is going to begin and focus his public ministry. Okay, so um, so he withdrew to that uh, area, leaving Nazareth. He dwelt in Capernaum by the sea, again, not the Mediterranean Sea, the Sea of Galilee, really the Lake of Galilee, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Hmm. That what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled Okay, uh, the land of Zebulun, Naphtali, towards the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region, the shadow of death, light has dawned. All right, so what's going on there? Why is all this even here? Well, again, if we knew our Old Testament very well, it'd become um, a bit more, uh, it'd pop out. It'd be, um, it'd be a little bit more obvious. So it's through that area, essentially, that... See if I there's a better map. See if I had my act together, I would um I would have an electronic map for you to watch. Um Okay. So on this map, you can see the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Holy Land, uh here in this this region here. Here's Egypt, okay. That's the uh Dead Sea, the River Jordan up to the Sea of Galilee. Now, what I want to point out is Assyria and Babylon, Babylonia, okay, modern day Iraq, and then sort of northern Iraq, and kind of getting into Iran and and and, and wherever else, Armenia. Um, so we talked about the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So the Assyrians in the 700s BC, they came and attacked the Holy Land, and the the northern ten tribes. Um, we, we have to remember that the 12 tribes of Israel, um, just two generations after David, um, so in the mid 900s BC, those 12 tribes of Israel that settled the land, um, they split. Uh, and so you had, actually there's a, the kingdom, the divided kingdom. Okay, here's the divided kingdom. So the divided kingdom. So you had the northern 10 tribes, which was called Israel. Okay. And then you had the southern two tribes, basically Judah and Benjamin. Okay. So that's where the northern kingdom of 10 tribes, the southern kingdom of two tribes, they split after uh, Solomon uh, had died. So, and uh, it never reunited. And so when... Uh, in the 700s, um, the Assyrian Empire, the Syrians had grown strong in the 700s BC, okay? And so they came and they took over the northern 10 tribes. They weren't able to take over the southern two, 
um, they took over the northern ten tribes and they brought them, they scattered them throughout all their, their empire, okay? Um, so, but the point is, the Assyrians came from the north. They would have first attacked the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. So the 12 tribes of, of God's kingdom, which unfortunately had split, uh, it begins to dissolve from the north. It begins to dissolve precisely in this area of Zebulun and Naphtali um, and never to be seen restored again. Well, until our Lord comes. So our Lord, uh, Isaiah prophesied that this restoration would be coming. Hopefully I didn't lose my spot. In that... Uh, uh, where is this? Uh, Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9. So Isaiah 9, um, that is right after the Assyrians have taken um, the northern ten tribes. And now he's beginning to prophesy restoration. He's beginning to prophesy hope. And so Isaiah says, all right, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, towards the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness, ah, have seen a great light the light of the world, Christ, while well, he's predicting. Okay, and so where the 12 tribes began to disintegrate, they will begin to be restored. And you're going to see that. Um, so, all right, right after that, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh that synonymous, the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with kingdom of David. The kingdom is at hand. Oh, okay, because the king who's been anointed at his baptism has arrived, and he's come to restore. And he's restoring the 12 tribes uh, of this kingdom by what happens? The very next sentence, verse 18, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and, and he called to them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. All right, so... Um, Jesus is beginning to select his 12 apostles, where the 12 tribe kingdom began to disintegrate with the Assyrian attack back in 700s BC, back in that northern region. So it's going to be precisely where the disintegrate, disintegration began in that area of Zebulun and Naphtali that the restoration would occur. And so Christ, the king, is walking onto the scene. He has been anointed, and he's here to restore. And so he's restoring precisely where it fell apart, where it began to fall apart, and he's beginning to collect his 12 apostles who are reflective, obviously, of the 12 tribes of Israel. He's come to fulfill. It drives me crazy when um, you know, non-Catholic Christians oversimplify the gospel and i don't think they mean to or whatever but when you just hear you know jesus came he died for our sins have faith in him and you'll be saved it's like okay yes that is true and yes that's actually the really important part of it but that's not it and i don't think they would say that's it but when you overemphasize one aspect of what the lord is doing perhaps not even consciously these other things other important things are falling uh, aside, they're being neglected. Our Lord said he came not to abolish, but to fulfill, and that every letter of the law would be fulfilled. And that's what he's doing. We're seeing that again and again and again, just in, we're barely four chapters into this. And so much of the Old Testament is being fulfilled. Uh, our Lord didn't come simply to die. He actually did a lot of stuff uh, before he died. And so right now he's in the middle of restoring the kingdom. Um, so that's that. So um, it, it seems like he's just meeting these first four apostles for the first time. But actually, when you go to John's gospel, um, you learn that they had been disciples of John the Baptist. And they had 
come to uh, you know, uh, they've come to know about Jesus through John, and eventually John's like, you know, the one I've been talking about predicting, he's right over there, and so it wasn't a completely cold encounter as it kind of seems here. But again, Matthew is doing all this for a purpose. He has a narrative uh, that he's wanting to give us. It's all true. Um, but uh, this isn't the first time, for instance, our Lord encountered these first four apostles. All right, let's finish this off. All right, so verse 23. And he, Jesus, went about all Galilee, teaching their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. His, uh, so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptic, epileptics, uh, para, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. Okay, that's the end of chapter 4. But there's still some, uh, some important stuff here. First of all, you can kind of see this as a, a summary of Jesus' public ministry before you know, he's to go and die. He spends a lot of time up here in Galilee. Um, in the, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they kind of focus on Galilee. John focuses a little bit more on Jesus going back and forth from Jerusalem. Uh, but what do we have here? All right, he went through all of Galilee from one town after another, uh, teaching in their synagogues. Okay, so first of all, synagogue obviously is a Jewish place. Um, but at the time of Jesus... Uh, let's keep in mind that the Jews didn't have the obligation to go the, to synagogue on Saturday. Um, their obligation was not to work. Um, now, as good Jews, they would uh, not be able to work on Saturday. They had to do something. And so the synagogue, which literally just means a gathering place, um, was a place where the Jews could come together and learn more about the scriptures. And so that's what they would do. It basically be a scripture study um, they would perhaps sing some hymns, and they would probably deal with other, you know, sort of local business as well. It wasn't exclusively religious. Um, you know, maybe, uh, well, at any rate, so that, that's the important. It's not like Jewish church. It's, there wasn't an obligation. It was a little bit more, a uh, little, little less structured in that sense. Um, okay, so it was a good place to go and learn about the, uh, the, the, the Old Testament. So that's where Jesus would go, uh, when and where the Jews would gather, and that's when he would begin preaching, when and where. And so he would preach the gospel of the kingdom. Again, it's all about the kingdom. Uh, in the gospel, gospel, uh, euangelion, uh, literally means, okay, yes, good news, but it's more of a victory proclamation. Um, it's the Jews, uh, it's their understanding of uh in a battle. So let's say an enemy was coming and uh, they had amassed an army and we and our walled city um, you know, the, uh, would put together an army and go out and meet them. If we won, if we won the victory, yeah, you know, somebody from our side would come running back to the city saying, hey, we just won. Our city's not going to be destroyed. Our women aren't going to be, you know, you raped and them and our children sold into slavery. Our men aren't going to be killed. This is, in fact, good news. But it's not good news like, you know, the Yankees or Red Sox win a game. It's good news insofar as it's a victory proclamation from a battle. Um, so at any rate, that's what we mean by gospel. And we'll talk more about that when our Lord wins the ultimate victory with his death. So he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, ah, and healing every disease and every infirmity. Why? Because he's just a nice guy, wants to show off. No, I think a couple things. Um, one, you know, you'll notice throughout his public ministry, he'll give a teaching and then he'll perform a miracle. He'll perform a miracle, and then he'll give a teaching. So the multiplication of loaves, accompanied by, you must eat my body and, and drink my blood in order to have life in you, the bread of life discourse. And so the miracles were meant not to show off, but to show, hey, you need to pay attention to me. I may actually be somebody important, and what I have to say may uh, be helpful and may be important and may be coming from God. Uh, so that's why he's performing miracles. But he's also fulfilling. Um, 
where was this? Healing Every Disease. This was in Exodus 20, is it Exodus 24? Let's see how quickly I can come to it. Haha, <laughs> good. Yeah, no, 23, Exodus 23, um, verse 25. Uh, you will serve the Lord your God, and I will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. All right, so before the golden calf, God's promising to take away sicknesses from, from his people. So in a way, Christ is restoring that. But in fact, he's going to restore all the way back to the beginning. Remember that sickness and death um, were a result of the fall of the sin, first sin of Adam. And so Christ has come not to, to conquer an army and restore whatever sort of earthly glory, but rather he's come to conquer sin and death itself and um, to restore what was in the very beginning, um, which was supposed to be without uh, sickness um, and death. Um, so at, at any rate, that's yet another indication of his interest in restoration. So I think that's it. We went a little bit longer today, but um, there's a lot packed into chapter four and I wanted to get through it. Uh, so we will end there and pick up with chapter five next time. Uh, take care. God bless.